Hello and welcome to the 43 Minutes of Heaven we call the D1 Baseball Podcast. I am your host, Michael Patrick Rooney. Tonight's episode brought to us by our good friends at S2 Cognition. S2 Cognition delivers a revolutionary approach to helping athletes understand how in-game decisions impact their performance from youth levels all the way to the pros. Get an assessment, figure out if you're making good, bad, or indifferent swing decisions. That's the key. As Ted Williams say, uh, always said, I don't care what the swing is, give me any swing on a good pitch to hit versus the best swing in the world on a bad pitch to hit. So um, S2 has got you covered there. I want to also say thank you to Pitch Logic, a system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play, from youth leagues to the big leagues. Easy to use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level. See pitchlogic.com for more information. So uh, as you can see, if you're watching, I'm joined by Kendall J. Rogers, who we thought was going to make a big WWE type of entrance tonight, but he just decided to show up. Um, for kickoff, and then uh, Joseph J. Healy. Uh, gentlemen, I have a travel question for you. Mm-hmm. So so if you were booking a trip, I'm going to leave it very vague, would you prefer to rent a car and have that level of control, or would you prefer just to Uber everywhere? A uh, car, for sure. Joe? Generally speaking, yes, especially when you're covering games because you have things like weather delays and, and, and what have you. You just don't want to get caught out. But it really does depend, right? Um, if uh, if everything is central, like if my hotel is walking distance to the stadium, which rarely happens, but let's just say, um, well, Omaha is a good example. We rent at D1 Baseball kind of a community car, but not all of us have cars because we're walking to the game. We walk back to the hotel. We don't. So if things are centrally located, I'm not a, a I'm not opposed to just Ubering if I need to go off somewhere, but you know, the combination of wanting the freedom and also most times when you, when you're going to cover games, there's, you know, it's, it's not that easy to Uber everywhere. Um, I tend to lean on, on the car, but um, now I don't know. Why do you bring it up runes? Do you have a hot, hot, yeah, take on my, that? Not, not a hot take. My trip to Boston this week, the cost of rental cars has gotten so outrageous that I felt guilted into trying the Uber and uh, of course, the Uber from the hotel, from the airport to my hotel was $90, which got me off to a bad start. But I did, in fact, save money for the company. Um, Look at you. Yeah. Well, in Boston's a city, too, where like that, that is an example of like a city where it probably ends up being more convenient and cost effective to go the Uber route, right? Yeah. But it, you do lack, like, you know, if you want to go to the store and get water or, you know, like those types yeah. of things. And just to be clear, Kendall, you've never rented a car in your life, you rent trucks uh no i haven't run a car before <laughs> how old were you 25 I, w- I will say that we will in our community car in omaha this year we will not be shoved in like a small sedan i did get like a tahoe this year yes. so no one will be shoved in jake mint will not have to ride the trunk back to the hotel at all oh, that's right we did have to do that. yes <laughs> i love that the, st- the statute of limitations has run out on that so we can talk about it now yeah we can't yes. talk about that uh, i would never by the way in any banter i would never ever ever ride in a truck of a car yeah that, too old for that feels like that that would if be, i had a choice yeah the, the, obviously the if i don't if i'm not given a choice yeah first world problems that we don't have to ride in trunks you know it's like yeah. it's when we Sorry, were in our Jake. 20s, we were going to have we, we we did that gladly. So, um, gentlemen, let's let's whip around the nation. We it's tonight's Thursday evening. There are games going on as we speak. I haven't even turned them on. So, um, Joe, if you want to live update us at some point. So we Aaron was in Big East country this week watching games and he had a fan come up to him and say, love the pod. But could we please talk about the Big East more? And so we're going to start with the Big East. And I will I will provide context that the Big East has five teams that were worthy of mention on the Nerdcast this week, which is must listen uh, for the projection uh, projected field. Georgetown is in first place. Xavier's having a nice year. Uh, Creighton's having a really nice year. St. John's is having a really nice year. And then UConn is just, you know, they're coming on like gangbusters. So the Big East is very interesting. It would seem that Georgetown cannot afford to not be the first place team in that league. Um, we do worry about RPI cannibalism, but let's. I'm scrolling down now. Creighton at Villanova, Xavier at Seton Hall, Butler at St. John's, yeah. Connecticut at Georgetown. Safe to say, boys, Connecticut at Georgetown's the marquee series. Yeah, for sure. And, and let's have a quick. You know, this time of year, I feel like people 
really want to talk about the postseason picture. And and one thing that's really interesting about the Big East is historically you would look at this league and go, hey, if you have a good RPI in the Big East, chances are good as the season progresses that RPI is just going to trickle down, trickle down, and go down even more. Um, that's not going to be the case in the Big East this year. I mean, you're looking at Georgetown at 53, St. John's at 62, UConn 54, Creighton 39, and Xavier at 29. And then the other three teams, Nova, Seton Hall, and Butler – I mean, they're in the hundreds, but it's not like they're in the two hundreds like some of the West Coast teams. So, I mean, I mean, the, these biggest teams they may drop a little bit, but they're not going to drop this massive amount that we're accustomed to, which is a good thing for this conference if you're looking for a multi bid league. Joe, yeah, I have a, a follow up question for you. Do your thought, and then I have a follow up question for you. The other thing that's crucial for Georgetown there, they're leading the league at eight and one, but crucially, they they are done playing the bad RPI teams of the Big East. Now it's a double edged sword. Uh, the second half of their, or not second half, but the, the remaining portion of their conference schedule is tough. But if you win enough games, I, I kind of get a feeling Georgetown's RPI will be actually pretty good because they 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 still play obviously UConn this weekend. Uh, then they got Creighton, then they got Xavier, then they got St. John's, and they've got a midweeker with Boston College, which that's a positive from an RPI standpoint. So um, the, the the real trouble for them is already passed in terms of RPI. So it's just going to be about how many wins they can get. Yep. Boy, I would love to be Edwin Thompson's agent. That dude can coach. Goodness, he's so good. Uh, all right, Joe, conspiracy theory. Please, uh, I'd like you to entertain my conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. So we we know in the RPI era of college baseball, there are three leagues that have solved for the RPI. Those leagues are the SEC, the ACC, and your beloved Missouri Valley Conference, the Valley, if you will. Now, the Big East somehow, as Kendall's point is well taken, the math is the math. The Big East has somehow solved the RPI in 2024. Conspiracy theory. Creighton was an original member of the Valley. Before they left, in the middle of the night, they snuck into the coffers of the Missouri Valley, and they, made, they took pictures with a Polaroid camera of the RPI recipe. What say you, Joe Healy? Yeah, it's like a Watergate situation, you know. <laughs> they they got that got the information. They from went them. to the uh, they they went to the Kurt Reed Dan Heapner School of Scheduling. Yeah. Oh. Now, now um, known as well, now that you got the Mingeon School as a part of that university. Yes. Yeah, it's part of the coaching tree. It's the Missouri Valley coaching <laughs> tree. They're on that. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, and 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 I think crucially, what it's been too is you know UConn always plays a tough schedule. Um, you know, Creighton plays a ton of road games. And Xavier scheduled really tough this year. I, I'm not going to lie to you and say whether or not that's usual or not. I don't really know, but they did play a really tough schedule this year. So uh, it just kind of, you know, a, a bit of a perfect storm to put the Big East in, in this kind of position. Joe, this year for the preseason Big East coaches meeting, we're, you're going undercover as Kurt mm -hmm. Reed, honorable okay. alumnus of the yes. Big East, regardless of what league he played in. And if there's <laughs> some type of secret handshake, Mm -hmm. uh just you know we, we need some invest your best investigative work if you don't mind i'll do i'll I'll do what i can see what i could get there if, infiltrating that meeting it's like a freemasons type thing you know they have yeah. all their secret meetings and handshakes and, and all that stuff i'm sure i love it all right well that that will be that will be fun and georgetown plays again at where joe what's the name of their park isn't it the park named after the actor or the announcer or what was that park where the uh oh Maryland yeah they used to play it yeah, they used to play at uh, Shirley Povich Field, who is oh, a, a former column. sports writer for the Washington yes. Post, also the father of uh, television host Mari Povich. I was about to oh. ask that. Yeah, um, they no longer play there. They play at a, it's called Capital One Park. It's in the Virginia suburbs of, of Washington, D.C. So you're telling me he is the father. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Shirley, Shirley Povich, Sorry. you are Sorry, low, low hanging fruit, I had to go there. <laughs> Yes. Man, I tell you, Joe Healy in college put down some Mari Povich. My goodness. Oh, oh man. 2008 Love was heady times in the, in the oh, Healy apartment. Oh, always, that. always preferred whenever the baby was not the, the, the baby was not his. Always like yeah. that. So good. Uh, boys, let's go to the Southeastern Conference. <laughs> uh, Tennessee at Kentucky is the big series. Joe, um, I want to have you start us off with that series. Um, my first question, Devin Burks does not, he came out of the Tuesday game. Do we know anything? Is he playing? That feels like, even though his numbers aren't good, that feels like a critical piece of evidence for the series. Yeah, I have nothing, nothing to update there. I, I don't have anything on that. But you're right that 
he is the chief vibes guy for that team. Um, and look, and even if he doesn't play, like he's going to be a good dugout presence. But the thing about it is if, if there is any way possible for him to get out on the field physically, he's going to be out there. You know, that's just kind of the, the guy he is, but you're right that it is a, um, that that's a, that's a big loss to not have him on the field. Even if he is hitting two thirty five. the offense just hasn't been there this year, but you know, he is a guy that really sets the tone for that team. And so it's a loss when he's not on the field. Do you, uh, Kendall, do you remember who you picked in this series? I, I labored over this one. Um, I'll I think I up. went back and forth. Let me look who I picked. Yeah, I, 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 I know. I, now, I say Kentucky, that because yeah. I literally went back and forth on it. So I, can't, uh, I picked Kentucky. I mean, here's the thing about this series is I kind of think Tennessee is a better team on a neutral field. But I just think at Kentucky, I think Tennessee is so accustomed to kind of their style in their own their own area. Um, it's just hard for me to pick against Kentucky. Like I, I feel like I pick against them every week, and they make me eat my words. So this time I'm going to actually take them. Joe, you pick Kentucky too. I love it. I did. Yeah. I, home field advantage has been so strong in the SEC. So I, I'm going to lean on that. Also, a couple of a couple of thoughts here that make me lean towards Kentucky. One is big ballpark, Kentucky yeah. Proud Park. Um, it, it's not going to be crazy hot. Right? The temperatures are in like the 50s and 60s. So it's not going to be, uh, it, it won't be that warm weather launching pad you see sometimes. So there, there's that. Additionally, when when you look at Kentucky's offense, they don't they don't strike out. One of the things they do really really well is avoid the strikeout, put the ball in play, and I think that is a pretty good matchup for a Tennessee pitching staff that just doesn't strike out guys like they have the last couple of years. Now you know, of course, you don't have Dolander, you don't have Burns, and Beam has never been a big whiff guy. So you have a pitch to contact guy with Beam. You've got Xander Seacrest in the rotation. He's a pitch to contact guy. You're going with a staff day. Uh, to start the weekend with Chris Stamo starting. I'm, he'll probably do three innings, four if he's really feeling it. Nate Sneed, considering how hard he throws, is not a huge strikeout guy necessarily. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of contact for Kentucky, and that's tough because they can run. They're looking to hit the ball hard. They're not. Their approaches are not going to get too big. So I actually think that's a decent fit styles-wise there. If, if this was a Tennessee team that had uh, – you know, uh, well, the, old, the pitchers they used to have for sure. But if they had a healthy AJ Russell, right? If AJ Causey had pitched like he was pitching in non-conference play, I might have a different feel for it. But this iteration of Tennessee pitching feels like something that the Kentucky offense is is well suited to handle. Yep, this one's gonna. This has got a chance to be spicy. Like these are two teams. The, these are two teams that maybe would be ranked one and two in the SEC for how well they get under their opponent's skin. And they are both really good and really good at that. Like, this has got a chance to be really spicy. Kendall, what's another SEC series that is on your mind? I mean, again, we say it every week, but this is why the SEC is compelling because there's no such thing as a not compelling series or a non – like, even LSU at Missouri is of incredible import. But what's one for you, Kendall, that's top of mind? Yeah, I think the one that was supposed to start tonight, they got banged because of weather, and they'll do a DH tomorrow at 11 a.m., so it'll give us a nice uh, something nice to do all day long tomorrow. But uh, A&M and Alabama, you know, we spent uh, you know several minutes over the last week kind of comparing A&M and Arkansas, and this weekend will give us a pretty good idea, right, of how those two teams might match up before they meet later in the year because Arkansas goes on the road and loses the series to Bama last weekend. A&M's at Bama this weekend. I'm curious to see if Bama, if Lightning can kind of strike twice for them. I just feel like A&M with the way they're playing, I feel like teams have to play at a really, really high level to beat them two out of three. And I'm very, very curious to see if like Bama has that level in them this weekend and for a second straight week. Because if you look at the Arkansas series, you look at the Tennessee series, I mean, they had to scratch and claw to get the third game in each of those series. I'm just very curious to see how they look this weekend. I think Alabama's scrappy and competitive. Like they've got, they've taken Rob Vaughn's personality already. Yeah. I still don't know if they're good enough to play with those teams. Like to your point, kind of weak for a third time. Because I mean, they have a series yeah. win at home over Tennessee and Arkansas now. Yep. Yeah, and I I feel like they. This is going to sound like me taking credit away from Alabama. I don't want to. I'm I'm going to say it, but I don't mean it that way. But I felt like Arkansas and and. I felt like Alabama needed Arkansas and Tennessee to not play their best to beat them. 
And of course they pulled it off, but I don't, I don't feel like they, Alabama didn't trade punches with a vintage Arkansas and Tennessee teams that weekend. But again, like you got to win the games and Alabama did it. So, yeah. Yeah. The doubleheader, I think, helps Alabama a little bit from the standpoint of, you know, Texas A&M with, with that doubleheader might have fewer opportunities to bring out, you know, Oshenbeck twice in the in the series. You know, they could have theoretically done a Thursday, Saturday with Oshenbeck. Now they've got other guys. It's not like he's the yeah, this is not point. last year where he was literally their only <laughs> only effective bullpen guy for a while. But he is their best card to play in the bullpen. So the doubleheader does kind of neutralize their ability to use him a little more. So that is a little break for Alabama. Uh, and doubleheaders are just wonky, right? It's so hard to sweep a doubleheader that if you're Bama, you have to feel a little better about your chances to get one tomorrow and have a chance to, to win the series in the finale. Yeah. It's so the other three series that I just think this is what makes the SEC amazing. Ole Miss and Georgia, I, I feel like that's o- almost a must win series for both those teams because they're not they don't they're not playing with huge margins of error, in my opinion. Um, Auburn and Mississippi State. This is a must win for Auburn to keep their season alive. It's a must win for Mississippi State because you can't lose a series to Auburn where you are right now. Um, LSU at Missouri. That's a must win for LSU because they are three and twelve. And so again, the SEC just every series has a storyline. It's what makes the league so good. Hey, Vanderbilt, uh, real quick, runes. Vanderbilt yep. up on Florida as we talk, um, nine to five in the seventh. Oh. Of that one, there was a lightning delay at some point in that one, so it's taken a little while to get through. But uh, Vanderbilt up on Florida, isn't that crazy? Vandy's offense is just so Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like, what that man, I don't know that yeah. they scored nine runs all weekend last weekend against AM. Did they even score? Uh, nine? They did not, uh, they, they scored, scored six. six the whole weekend, yeah, crazy. And they were all in the last game, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's nuts. yeah. I mean, they're at home, which helps. And, and, you know, Florida has its own issues on the mound. I mean, Brandon, Brandon Neely, I was, I, I watched the first five or six innings of it before I started having to do some other stuff, but you know, Brandon Neely just kind of is what he is at this point. You, you get three, four good innings out of him. And then you, you need to know when to pull the rip cord on him. And if they just, it felt like they kind of just left him in a few batters too long, but they don't really have a choice, right? Yeah. Uh, they're just so short on options they're they're tr- they're asking things it's a li- little like old miss the last couple of years when they had like jack doherty and they were always asking jack doherty to throw five or six innings when really he should have just thrown four but mm-hmm. they they had to ask him to do that and that's it feels like kind of where florida is with with neely at this point sarah sanders by the way liz v i see in the chat giving us updates on that game thank you very much sarah sanders i see you in the chat does ecu host a super and what's it take how can they break on the top eight i would say first of all listen to the nerd cast it was awesome this week fitzy was on a heater he was absolutely in rare form um and then i would also say like for east carolina the first order of business is you have to win the american outright if you don't win the american outright that it's all null and void there's nothing that an RPI can do for you at that point. So. Yeah, bad, bad news too. I looked up their RPI needs on our uh, our old friend Boydsworld.com. He does an RPI needs report. Basically, according to this, and this is a moving target, it can change a little, but it's a pretty good guide. East Carolina would have to go undefeated the rest of the way to finish top eight in RPI. So that's obviously unlikely. Uh, now that doesn't take into account the, ter- the conference tournament. So that's a data point they could add theoretically at some point. But th- the point is that, there obviously for them it's important to get into the top eight just so they don't have to go on the road for a super but the path to do that is is really really tough and you don't want you don't want a cozy road to omaha for the first time east carolina anyway you want like at arkansas for a super regional like you yeah, want that's how they're gonna wanna... get there they're not gonna get there at home they're gonna get there like knocking somebody off yeah that's, i mean that's... Uh, they, i still think about was it 2016 texas tech for East, East Carolina, at, yeah, at Run, Texas the, Tech, the Omaha runs ninety feet away, right? Yep, yep, and that's you know at the time, Texas uh, Lubbock was as difficult as anywhere in the country to win postseason games. Yep. Uh, all right, boys, let's go ACC. I've got three series. I'm going to shrink the menu for you in the Atlantic Coast Conference: Florida State at Wake, UNC at NC State, Duke at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm just I remain uh, intrigued by Duke and. Um, as a team that could play late, late into June. And Virginia Tech is now one and five in their last three or in their last two ACC yeah. series. So Virginia Tech, uh, you kick a third weekend in a row and you're starting to get really uncomfortable. KR, which of those three uh, strikes your fancy? Uh, I will say Virginia Tech's really interesting because, you know, Duke is one of those teams that 
our, our, our ACC centric correspondent, Aaron Fittis, said he thinks it might actually be the best team in the ACC. And so I think this is Virginia Tech's chance to finally kind of make a make a statement. Uh, we've been kind of waiting on that since uh, the beginning of the season. And so I think at home, I think Virginia Tech's going to have a little bit of urgency. Obviously, they're an offensive club, but, you know, against Duke and, uh, you know, A.J. Gracia and guys like that, I mean, they're going to, you know, they're going to have to pitch at a pretty high level too. So very curious to see if Vate can finally get that signature series win. Joseph, what say you about this old Atlantic Coast Conference? I'm fascinated by UNC and NC State, which is going on as we speak. And last I saw was 5-5. Five, five. Yeah, 5-5 five, five in the 6th or 7th. Yeah, Ooh, so uh, yeah, going to the scoreboard yeah. now. Yeah, bottom, bottom six, uh, at least on the, the scoreboard right now. Um, it would be, I, I've now lived in the Triangle area long enough to know that anything involving, you know, NC State and Carolina on the diamond, like, it just is really wonky. And it would be the most, like, NC State, UNC rivalry thing for you know, state to be as up and down as they are like Carolina to have been as steady as they've been this season, just kind of trucking along and state goes out and wins this series. It reminds me a little bit of the 2021 season. And I remember that because I was sitting outside at Boschmer stadium because COVID precautions made it to where they had put the media on the concourse and NC state was staring in the face of not making, you know, not, not making the tournament. Uh, you know, they were, they were in a hole in the ACC and they went and swept U, a, a UNC team that was on a heater at that point, And it turned around their whole season. I'm not saying this is that necessarily, but I say that to say it would be a very NC state thing to, you know, be this Jekyll and Hyde program that is, that all of a sudden just kind of wakes up this weekend and plays its best baseball. NC state is Owen six at Louisville and Georgia tech. And that is, that, that, that would be exhibit A for how not to build a postseason resume. And I say yeah. that because NC State has a postseason resume, but it's like, I, I don't even know what the, you know, it's like somebody trying to cook steak without red meat. Like what? Don't do that. <laughs> don't go 0-6 against those two teams, you know, like it's, but that that is, that is vintage. That's why we love NC State. By the way, Joseph, I want to bring up Wake hosting Florida State. And I think game one will be Jamie Arnold against Chase Burns, which will be one of the great pitching matchups of the season. And um, you are the only person, Joe, that did not pick the host Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, N-O-L-E-S, Knowles. Um, I should have done the other one. F-L-O-R-I-D-A-S-T-A-T-E. Florida State, Florida State, Florida State. Woo. I didn't want to yell too hard. At that was a very, time. that was a very low key woo. Well, I, you know, I Safety trying first. to keep, keep the, the volume at a certain, at a certain level. I don't want to blow out the mic, but yeah, I just, so I'm, I'm in on, Hey, wake is back. Like I, I generally speaking, I'm in on that, right? I, they're playing a lot better. There's a lot of reasons for optimism. However, I don't think, I mean, this clearly is not last year's wake. And they could be some version of that. They could be 75, 80% of that. They could be an Omaha team, all of that. But I just think Florida state's been too good this year to just kind of hand wave away a series against what's really been one of the hottest teams in college baseball all season long. And schedule is what it is, but it just seems like a lot to hand wave away a team that's been as good this season as Florida state, just because wake has played better for the last two or three weeks here. So, I mean, this could go either way. It's a road series for for FSU. I don't love that about my pick, but it, it just felt like, hey, if, if this Florida State team is as good as it looks like they can be, like th- this is a winnable series for them. And Joe, if you want to take down Etheridge Farms, the juggernaut that is Etheridge Fair. Farms, mm-hmm. you can't be afraid to get out on a vine like that. And just, right. you know, yeah, you got it. It's th- these types of champions are not going down without a fight. Yeah, Eth, I just, Eth, you know, has, I, Eth has no statements tonight, huh? Nope. Nope. He's, he's focused on, um, I asked and he's, he said, he's just focused on next week and is, you know, wanting to keep his head down. And I, you know, I, I try to be true to my picks. I just pick who I want to pick, but we're at the time of year now where it's kind of like, okay, finishing fourth, it really isn't that much better than finishing, finishing seventh or eighth. So like, you got to take some chances, right? Yeah. You, you have to start to really pull some stuff. So, um, this would be, it's a chance for me to steal a game since everybody else picked, uh, picked wake. 
Final round of the Masters. Yeah, you, you got right. some. You got fire at pins, uh, boys. Uh, before we do, we'll go to the Big Twelve. Let's take a quick break. One thing I do want to say is that postseason baseball is right around the corner. This year's Phillips sixty six Big Twelve Baseball Championship is bigger and better than ever. It's May twenty first to the twenty fifth. Ten teams and Coach Rooney will be there for the Big 12 title. Found out today, I will be at Climate Control Globe Life Field, home of the Texas Rangers. Uh, and if you want to elevate your experience, uh, you can't actually come up into the booth with me. That would be, that would, you know, that we'd, you'd have to work. You don't want to do that. You want to do- way up there too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's high. It's elevated. But what you really would rather do is have new premium ticket options with premier seats and club access, complimentary perks. You don't want to view the Big 12 championship like Coach Rooney. You want to view it like the big dogs, like KR over there. Um, secure your tickets today. Visit globelifefield.com slash big 12, globelifefield.com slash big 12. Uh, let's take a quick break, and we will come back with the large 12. And we're back. Pat, if you're listening, we took our break for Pat the Stat at 25 minutes and about 45 seconds. Very good. Uh, gentlemen, let's talk about the Big 12. There's some, so I I circled three series. TCU at Texas, Oklahoma State at Kansas State, West Virginia at Texas Tech. What say you, uh, pick one, pick a winner there, KR. Uh, I'm going to go with Texas against TCU. I think this is a really interesting series and for all the wrong reasons. Uh, if you look at TCU, they're sitting at 38 in the RPI, which is a pretty good spot, right? Like not bad. Uh, the problem is they're near the bottom of the league in the conference standings. So right now they're very much on the bubble. We, I, you know, they could go either way at this point. Texas, had we done the projections about an hour later, might not have been in our field because their RPI dropped like seven spots to like, in you know, to the high seventies after losing to UTRTV uh, earlier this week. But you know, the Longhorns have the opposite problem. Their RPI is in the seventies, but their conference standings in a really good spot. So. I think as both these teams look ahead to the postseason, and I know it's you know, still a little early to be looking ahead to that, but as the committee is trying to pick and choose who they like as at-large teams, this series could mean a lot because right now both of these teams, unless something changes down the stretch, both of these teams will be bubble-esque teams come Selection Monday. So for that reason and that reason alone, beyond the rivalry aspect, uh, this is a huge series. Amen. Joseph, what say you here? I like the series with West Virginia and Texas Tech in yeah. Lubbock um, on, on a couple of levels. One is that, you know, if, if you're Texas Tech, you're in decent shape with regards to the postseason, but you really can't afford to take on too much more water, especially with as compact as the Big 12 standings are. Like you could you could lose one or two games and end up eighth in that league. And, you know, how is the committee going to view that? All of that stuff. So. That's important for them. And then for West Virginia, I mean, they're in position to maybe win the Big 12 this season. But now, you know, whether holds back, but he's not 100% healthy. They've got some other injuries they're dealing with. Uh, you know, I heard Aaron mention on the Nerdcast that Randy Mazie said this was the most injured team he's ever had. So that gives you an idea of what they've had to battle. And yet they're in position to maybe win the league. So if you're West Virginia, you're, you're going to just have to grind this out if you're going to try to compete for a, for a championship. And with tech being somewhat vulnerable this year, this is an opportunity to, to win a road series that would go a long way towards that. Man. And remember last year, Oh, I'm, I'm unmuted. Good. Remember last year, West Virginia goes to Austin with the big 12 regular season title, just sitting right there and they get swept and it's like, they never recovered. They really didn't play great in Lexington. I believe they got sent to Lexington for the regional. Um, and you're right, Joe, like JJ Weatherhold is really gutting it out. Um, I just I will say Oklahoma State at Kansas State. I have the Sunday game. I think it's really intriguing because Oklahoma State is a team that I am taking the cheese on right now. Uh, I just it's interesting. They have less star power than the last two teams that lost home regionals, but they're playing good baseball. And uh, Kansas State won a big game over Northeastern this week. And you know Pete Hughes won joking around when he said he's not leaving RPI to chance, but they do have to continue to win games in the league. Like they that that this is a, a really important series for for both teams. Um, yeah, so Big 12, very interesting. All right, let me just keep going down the RPI trail here. So the number four RPI league, um, I know you guys know this, but say it out loud just for the fans. What's the number four RPI league right now? Anybody? Uh, I'm going to go with the Pac-12. Joe? No. Uh -oh. Sunbelt? Sun, yeah, I was going to say Sunbelt. Funbelt. Funbelt it is. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what is what is big? I think Louisiana goes to Coastal. That's the big series that's in the, the fun belt yeah, this week. That's really big for Louisiana because the problem is, as we look again, we look at the postseason. They're a very weird club. They're thirty and nine. They're winning that league. I mean, they're what thirteen, fourteen, and won that league. Uh, but their RPI is fifty. So they really need to get that series win because Coastal's RPI is seventeen. If they can go on the road and win that series, then they probably get a pretty sizable boost uh, from that series win. Wow, Joe Etheridge Farms selected. So uh, of the ten of us, seven picked Coastal, home Coastal, and uh, Eth, Patrick Ebert, Pebert, and Shotgun picked the Raging Cajuns. I just I'm going to give you my premise, Joe. I just I like Louisiana's team better, but I don't like a team led by pitching going into that very hitter friendly park. Fair? Yeah, I, I would I would generally agree with that. I think that's a good read on it. W- wouldn't be surprised if if it goes the other way, but yeah, I mean. The, Conway is not the place to go if you're going to try to try to win with with pitching and keeping the the score low. I, I'm also in the Sun Belt this week. I think Georgia State and Troy is interesting. Uh, Troy or Georgia State coming off of winning a series against Southern Miss that actually puts them into a one, two, three, four, five way tie for second place in the Sun Belt, which is part of the problem with the Sun Belt right now from a postseason standpoint is they need to start they need to get some more separation because you're not going to get seven teams into the postseason. Um, so it would help to separate a little bit. But don't look now, but Troy got off to a slow start, but but Troy's making a move. And they've got a series, I believe that's a home series. Yes, a home series against Georgia State, whose RPI is pretty good. It's 67 as we sit here today. So you win that series, you get the RPI into the 60s. I don't know if there's enough quality wins to get them there ultimately, but this Troy team that we kind of gave up on is obviously really talented and, and now they're starting to make a move. It's just a matter of if it maybe is coming a little bit too late. Well said. Uh, after the Sun Belt, let's look at the Big Ten real quick. Let's see what we got there. By the way, Kendall, I wanted to say this. I said this to some people over text. On the Nerdcast this week, at about the 54-minute mark, anyone that's not listening to the Nerdcast, the rant on the Summit League was all-time great. One of the all-time great nerdcast rants. Yeah, Aaron gets like fired up over some of the strangest things. One of his <laughs> it was. Greatest, it's one of his greatest traits. He well, I like I, so, mind. like yes. I, I, it just you know, it's kind of one man's trash is another man's treasure kind of deal. Where he's angry that the Summit League is having a tough year, generally speaking. I'm fascinated by it. Like it really is incredible that an Oral Roberts team that is not completely depleted. I think it'd be easy to be like, oh well, yeah. They, I mean, they lost everybody, right? Well, not really. They lost a yeah. lot of good players, but they they bring back their two, you know, two of their three starting pitchers from last year's team. They have three or four guys back in the lineup from last year's team, and they're playing in the Summit League, and they're in last place. Like that, that that just, I mean, no disrespect, but they're behind Northern Colorado in the standings in the Summit League. Like it's just. So I'm just I I would take the approach of like, hey, isn't this weird? Whereas Aaron jumps to jumps to anger. Noted Rageaholic Aaron Fit, of course. Rageaholic. It's underrated. Uh, so let's go to the Big Ten. This the two series of interest to me. And uh, again, you guys can order off the menu if you choose to. Rutgers at Iowa feels like just an absolute must win for both teams. And uh, unless you're just planning on winning the Big Ten tournament and then it's all gravy, uh, Maryland at Nebraska feels like another important series. Uh, any any thoughts there, gentlemen? I I think with Rutgers is kind of sneaky. I mean, they, they touched on this a little bit on the Nerdcast that we, we've now referenced 100 times. But like Rutgers is not dead in the water to be a postseason team if they can get moving. I mean, the RPI is inside the top 50. I think we generally like the talent there. But in a Big Ten where you're looking at like Nebraska and then who else, right? I mean, there, there's probably going to be a second team emerge. And and right now, the only two that are really in decent RPI shape are, uh, well, Rutgers, Maryland, and, and Ohio State. And none of those three teams are really playing that well in the league. So one of those teams needs to kind of make a move to improve its standing in the league to make that RPI work for it. And and why not Rutgers, I guess? Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a soft spot for teams like Rutgers who, you know, just they had they had a regional caliber team that just ended up playing a not very good schedule a couple of years ago. And that always bums me out when you feel like one of those schools where it's hard to build that kind of roster and you can't capitalize on it. But, you know, there's always good redemption coming. I know there's redemption in Rutgers future. And I know Steve Owens is a great coach. I just don't know when those when that stock's going to cash in. 
So, right. yeah, it'll be interesting. It's, it'll be a big next couple of weeks for Nebraska. You know, one of the questions somebody had uh, earlier today on Twitter was like, hey, can Nebraska still host? Uh, they definitely can still host. They're sitting at 20 in the RPI, but that, you know, they have a tough series this weekend. They've got Iowa in a couple of weeks. You know, Iowa would love to knock them off. Uh, so I would say Nebraska guys still still heavily in the mix for a host site, but their margin for error, especially in a Big Ten that's not loaded with good RPIs, is pretty low. Yep. Uh, boys, let me take you to the Pacific 12 yeah. conference. Oh. Do you guys hear that? Yeah. What? Oh, I've got a plane, and, and I thought it was playing on the show. That is amazing. Oh, what was it? You, you were, I can't so, see. Yeah, so I'm uh, like, you know, I'm surfing the sites, looking up standings and t- stuff like that. I can't tell which site it is, but uh, I think it might be Warren Nolan, maybe. But um, a commercial just started blaring in my ears, and I, <laughs> at first I thought it was you guys singing, and then it was no, it was it was just uh, a random it was, commercial. It was Joe's beautiful voice singing. Uh, I knew it was it was uh, it was not Joe's beautiful voice. Uh, so, boys, let's talk about the Pacific Twelve, and yep. there are some interesting series there. Let me pull it up. Okay, so what Oregon State at Cal feels like Cal is hanging around, kind of like what you said about Rutgers, Joe. <laughs> A win or two mm-hmm. over Oregon State would go a long way for that resume. Utah every weekend is interesting because it's like you just keep looking at it like, man, are they are they going to really do this? Like, is Cal is is Utah going to really have a uh, non uh, a, an, you know a postseason resume without winning the league outright? So, what say you guys about those two or, or any of in? The- yeah, I mean, Utah is unfair as it seems, guys. Utah's in a situation be, because the, the the RPIs on the West Coast are so iffy. They're in a situation where they're gonna pretty they're gonna have to be pretty consistent in that league, because like Washington, for instance. Well, I don't think honestly, don't think even though you look at the record, like I don't think Washington's like an they're not an awful team, right? Like mm-hmm. they're more than capable of taking two or three Utah, but their RPI is not very good. So if Utah Utah drops that series, they're probably back to being a bubble team. So they're just Utah's in a weird position to where, like, their margin for error is pretty small, even though, like, they haven't had many errors this year. So that it's kind of a strange team in that regard. And then Runes, I, I think as you look out west, I think if there's one team in the pack that I think can make a move, I think it's Cal. I, I just think when you look at their star power, you look at some of the experience they have, the RPI is not in a horrible spot. It's not in a great spot, but it's not in a, in a really bad spot. Uh, they get OSU at home. If they can win that series this weekend, I would not be shocked if Cal goes on a run. And then, you know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but Cal is one of those teams that because of Loma Vida and Green and guys like that, like I would not want them on my re- in my regional. So I'll be curious to see if they can do just enough to get in the tournament. And Ian May could have enough pitch count. Like he's been creeping yeah. up like two innings, three innings. He's doing – it's gone really well. Um, Joe, let me give you, I'm going to give you a big menu of series to choose from. I'm going to kind of span the globe, if you will. Wichita State at East Carolina is of interest to me. UNCW at Northeastern, Friedman Diamond, if you will. Uh, Liberty at Western Kentucky. Louisiana Tech at DBU. So the Conference USA, the the, the conference of our nation, is uh, has got some stuff going on. Um, Ohio U at Bowling Green, just because Bowling Green's 15-0 and 0 in the MAC, uh, 1A. Indiana State at Illinois State. Is Illinois State Steve Holmes sneaking around at the top of the standings? Uh, and then Portland at Gonzaga. Uh, Joe, you go first. Any of those tickle your giblets, as Stephen Schock would say? Uh, yeah, a- absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're – they're, never mind. They uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. Yeah, I – um. First, quickly, Jeremy Moody on. I think I think Jeremy joined us on our chat earlier this week and asked a similar question: What has to happen for Louisiana to host? Like, you're going to really have to run away with the Sun Belt because the RPI is not good relative to hosting. It's good, oh, it's fine overall, but relative to hosting, it's not good. That series lost to Rice earlier this season is really hurting the Cajuns in RPI. Mm. They're 52 right now. I haven't looked at their their numbers. I'm doing it right now, like as we. Uh, okay. So yeah, they can't get into the top 16 in RPI and to get into the top 32, they have to win like 14 of their last 18, which they could very well do, but that's top 32. That's, so that's not really in the discussion. Yeah. So I think, I think it's, I don't want to say impossible 
Uh, because look, if they go on this, if they just rip off a bunch of wins during the season and, and win the regular season and tournament, who knows? But it's really thin. I think it's more likely that the Cajuns end up as an absolute nightmare of a two seed for some poor SEC team, um, you know, that at the back of the hosting spot, you know, because they'll be Louisiana will probably be one of the top twos on the board. Um, that that seems like their fate. So I don't I don't want to say never, but Jeremy, I think you're probably looking at a two seed for better or worse. Yeah, I mean, uh, L- Louisiana is essentially like the Oregon of the of the South. I mean, if you look at Oregon, Oregon's a half game out of first place in the Pac-12, and they're 63 in the RPI. Yeah, just a very yeah. very similar uh, team. 26 10 overall record, 10 5 lead mark, but sitting there at 63. Um, it's just th- those two RPIs are just a little odd. I uh, getting back to Runes' question. I think I'm most intrigued by UNCW at Northeastern there. First of all, because I mean, we're talking about the cauldron that is Friedman Diamond, of yes, course. Yes, cauldron. Um, you don't just walk in to Brookline onto the Friedman Diamond and expect to get out alive. So that's, <laughs> that's right. that. That's it. That's on the front of my mind, obviously. But it, it you know, UNCW is actually le- leading this league. Northeastern has the stronger postseason resume. RPI is better. All of that. However, road series win here for UNCW over Northeastern. I would imagine that RPI is in a lot better shape. They would also get a little bit of breathing room between them and the Huskies at the top of the CAA. So I, I think that one's a, that, that one's a really fun one. Um, so that, I think that's where my mind goes. Uh, you know, we're, we talked about ranking Northeastern and I can't guarantee anything, but you know, you win a series, take over the lead in the CAA. We'll probably be having a discussion about the Huskies again Sunday night for, for ranking them if they end up winning that series. Love it. Uh, Kendall, what did you guys decide on Conference USA on the Nerdcast? Did you end up as one bid? Because of RPI yes. challenges. Yeah. The problem with the Conference USA is, you know, like Western Kentucky, like Mark Reardon's done an incredible job, but they're 93 in the RPI. Yep. Yeah. Liberty's it's winning the league the, and their RPI is 144. Yeah. they Liberty just got off to an insanely cold start and they just, you know, they started playing well in the last three or four weeks. I was going to ask, which would you oh, say? Ahead, Joe. You said Conference USA is the conference of our country. Do you think it's that or the American? Well, that's. I was just going to ask you the same question. Like, what's the oh, most? I, I, the Americans, the conference of the continent, or is it the Patriot League? That's what I'm saying. Like, what's the, here's the question we, we need to ask ourselves. God, I'm so conflicted. What is the most patriotic conference in American collegiate sports? Is well, it's it, got to be the Patriot League with Army and Navy. Yeah, but no mention of our country. I mean, they, you know, they could be patriotic to their high school. Like Conference USA, Kendall, that's the conference of our nation. The American Athletic Conference, I just I think the word athletic takes away from it. Well, I do tell people that Dan Heepner is my president. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. I, I Conference USA feels it's always felt like a just poorly named league to me. And tonight I have just had this epiphany, Joe, that this might be America's most patriotic conference. It's the conference of our nation. Look, I mean, it, it, one of the arguments I'd make for Conference USA being our our most patriotic conference is that if we believe in the ideal of America being a melting pot, there is nothing like melting pot like Conference USA. Amen. That conference has had like 50 teams in it in the last 30 years. <laughs> like the if you go to Wikipedia and look at Conference USA, you know, have you ever been to a conference's Wikipedia page where it has the timeline of who's been in the league when, you yes. know? Do yourself a favor, listeners. Go to Conference USA's Wikipedia page and look at their membership timeline. It is wild. Um, many, so, look, how many again, total teams have been in Conference USA in the history? I don't know. If you guys vamp a little bit, like I'll see 16? what I can find. It's like why? It's like going to Williamsburg, Virginia. Like everyone goes there in grade school. I don't care what state you live in. <laughs> That's right. I'll see what I can find. You, if you guys vamp, yes. Um, I see uh, Liz V. Liz V is in victory. Jacob Cozart hit a three-run homer. Yeah, that would be so on brand. On right film. Yeah, NC State beat winning that series versus North Carolina would be on brand. While Joe is getting doing some fact checking for us, I do want to say we're gonna we're gonna wrap pretty quickly here. Um, this is we we've got five weekends of the regular season left, five, and then yeah. conference tournaments, and so. If you don't have an, a subscription to D1Baseball.com or SEC Extra, do yourself a favor and do it right now. Now, things you can type in for a discount. 24 season will get you a discount. Uh, hashtag for all the wrong reasons. Type that in there. See what happens. Uh, RPI conspiracy theories is another thing to type in there. Rise <laughs> hey, up Rins, Brookline. Can, Rins, yes. I have a new one for you. Yeah, what do you got? If you type in Conference USA, it gives you, it gives you $17.76 off. 
interesting conference of our nation. I think given Thank you. I'm just going to pat myself for that one. That was well, pretty good. Well <laughs> given the given the uh, gravity of the UNCW at Northeastern series taking place at at the Cauldron, if it were, if it were, as it were, uh, Friedman Diamond. Type in Rise Up Brookline at checkout. Uh, you know, that's one option. Aaron Fit might cover your subscription. Or you could just type in, if you want to get a little little chippy, type in Thoughts and Prayers Seahawks as they enter Friedman Diamonds. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, here's a little side note. It looks like Florida's about to lose. Uh, you know, Florida and LSU are going to be really tough one and two seeds and in, in Mark's uh, Cohog uh, field this year. Cohog. What does Cohog stand for again? That's with a Q. It's right? some sort of Homer. It's some sort of Simpsons deal. Oh, but he, right. uh, you know, it's he does a, his uh, fate. He does his fate tournament field every year. And, it's a uh, reference LSU to Family Florida, Guy. They really, live in uh, a really good one and two seed. Family. It's a Family Guy reference. They live in a town called. Oh, Cohog it's Family Guy. Okay. Family See, that guy. tells you how much I know. Yeah. Um. So, I, I've done my research on Conference USA. First of all, the actual conference that has the wildest membership page is the SoCon, but the SoCon's been around since 1921, and oh. at one point included basically every team that is currently in the SEC. So that's you know that's it. they've just been they've got the advantage of having been around more than a hundred years at this point. Conference USA, mind you, started in 1996. No uh, we were all alive at that point. Um, so Conference USA has had 32 full members. That doesn't include affiliate <laughs> members. That doesn't include you know. But 32 full-time members, including some teams you may have forgotten were in Conference USA at various points, such as uh, St. Louis, uh, such as, uh, well, DePaul doesn't count because that's a bat where they don't have a baseball program. But, uh, you know, Marshall, Conference USA. Were my, um, my beloved Temple Owls ever a member of Conference USA? No, or they went the, from Big East to the American. American, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, TCU Conference USA member. <laughs> wow, way back in the day. Yep. Anyway, amazing. Yeah, just thirty-two full-time members. Did you look up the WAC in that in that um, research, oh, that'd Joe? Good, that'd be a good one too. Yeah, because they had... they really got it. Yeah, they. The WAC is really like the WAC. You don't go to the WAC for dinner. WAC's more of a heavy hors d'oeuvres kind of conference. Like we're yeah, you're not gonna you're gonna kind of get in, you're gonna get out, unless you're. <laughs> really serious about appetizers. Oh god, yeah. Th this one, this one's long two runes. Like now, now also SoCon, or much like the SoCon. So this conference has been around since 1962. Ah, so it does right. have a an age advantage here. But um, give me 30 seconds, and I'll count these up. The Arizona schools have were in the Western Athletic Conference, I believe, at one point before before the the, the beloved six pack. So very good. I'm guessing 35 for the 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 uh, Western Athletic Conference. Joe's counting out loud right now. 43. Wow. Yeah. Every member of the Pac-12, basically. Uh, Give or take, Stanford, Cal. Yeah, Arizona, Arizona State, uh, Utah. Um, so only those, but yeah. a, a lot of Mountain, a lot of Mountain West, you know. Um, a lot of teams that are no longer like FBS football outfits. That was a, the reason why a lot of them moved out, you know, is yeah. getting rid of FBS football. Torturous. Uh, boys, let's wrap with this. Where where are we going to be this weekend? I, I'm going to be from the fighting city of Prescott, Arizona. Speaking of patriotic, um, I've got, I mentioned, I've got Kansas State hosting Oklahoma State Sunday night. KR, where, where, where what's your plan of attack? Uh, I'm in the fine city of Houston. Who who is doing the, the uh, Texas TCU game Saturday night? I could check Twitter. That's that's it's on. on well, it's on ESPN too. That's I was curious. Let's look. I wonder if it's Zeke and Zonk who are two of my favorites. Uh, Joe, while I'm looking that up, where 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 are you going to be? I will be in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I will be in Lexington for Tennessee and Kentucky. Looking forward to that. For like, I'm not a Kentucky baseball historian, although I did play one on TV for a six episode arc. Nice. Um, but I have to imagine it's one of the handful of the biggest series in Kentucky baseball history. Maybe when maybe late in that 2017 season when they were pushing to host, maybe early in 2018 because they were briefly ranked number 1 in the country in 2018. So maybe those, you know, maybe in 2006 the year they under John Cohen they won the league, maybe there's something there, but but long story short, I mean this weekend is got to be in the top 5 I would imagine. So it, it should be I, I imagine all three games will be basically sold out. 
Um, the weather looks like it's going to be pretty decent. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Yeah. And in fairness to Kentucky, the atmosphere, you know, it's their first time hosting in the new stadium, Kentucky proud park last year. The atmosphere was awesome. And that includes Indiana going two and zero in that thing. And it was real chippy. And it was, that was for squeeze play. We spent a lot of time in Lexington. That was really cool. Yeah, and they they overcome. They they have a good atmosphere, kind of in in spite of some of what the stadium provides. It's a, it's a beautiful stadium. Like, and it's 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 one of my favorite SEC venues to to cover a game at. It's just very comfortable and and easy to access. And there's just a lot of benefits to it. However, from a design standpoint, it's one of those stadiums that has a lot of like berm and open areas. Once you get down past like the the first base and third base bags, and so that doesn't trap sound quite as much. Um, as in other parks and there's not as much outfield, there's really not a lot of outfield seating or anything like that. So it, it, you do kind of lose some of the sound, but in spite of that, yeah, they, they do, they do have a pretty good atmosphere there when they're, when they're filling it. And now that the weather's warmed up and the team is really good, I, I imagine it's gonna be a lot of good crowds out there the rest of the year. Kendall, Zeke and Zonk will do all three games this weekend. TCU at Texas, they'll do two for Longhorn Network and then one for uh, ESPNU, it looks like. So there you go. Zeke and Zonk are fun. If you've not heard them do a game because you don't have Longhorn Network, it's worth it. They're going to be doing the Friday night game on ESPNU. Those those two are a blast. They're actually Friday night ESPNU, Saturday ESPN2, Sunday looks like Longhorn Network. So there you go. One uh, one more quick thing, Rune, Runes, because we got another comment. Liz, who is who is uh, kept us apprised of the scores today while well, we were on on the air. Thank you, Liz. Um, she asked a, a, a question relevant to to my life. Will uh, weekend waypoints be before the A and M Bama first game tomorrow? In a normal situation, Liz, the answer would be yes. However, I am traveling tomorrow morning. I think I will be driving from Cincinnati to Lexington at that point because I'm flying into Cincinnati. So. The weekend waypoints will be after that game has started, but will be before everything else has started. Joe, what so, time is your flight? Uh, like six twenty-five in the morning. I, it's I real feel early. like I feel like like four fifteen a.m. waypoints. Yeah, that's <laughs> just <yeah. laughs> way early in the morning. Yeah, just like a midnight waypoint. Dri- drive time, drive time a.m. talk show. You know. Yeah. It starts let let me morning. plug. Let me plug one more podcast, the Shock Factor podcast, which is part of our network. Stephen Shock and Jake Mintz and Jordan Schusterman are now taping their podcast at seven ish, eight ish in the morning. Now that's mm. what they're. It is amazing. Like if you had said to me, Stephen's personality will translate even better at eight in the morning, I would have said he won't be awake during the podcast. It has been. It has been glorious. I it must listen. I've enjoyed it. Can you imagine much. us trying to tell a fifth recorder uh, podcast at seven in the morning? Well, where he, where where Fitzy really gets upset is when we tell him we want to tape at three thirty in the afternoon when he wants to go eat dinner. So that's when <laughs> he has a silver plate uh, special yeah. that only runs from three to six. Yeah, he should have stayed up in New England and 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 stayed there for Friedman Diamond, even though the NC, UNC NC State series is very compelling. But all that said, uh, weekend ten is upon us. Everyone enjoy, have a great weekend, and that is it from here. Rise up, Brookline. And we will catch you next time on the D1 Baseball Podcast.